And now, oh God, open our hearts and our minds that we may hear. Through our hearing, we might believe. And through our belief, that we might act. It is in the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord and Savior, that we gather and pray and seek to live. Amen. This time I invite you to stand. You've been turning the Bible that's near you to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. You'll find this on page 1,392 of the Bible that is there in your chair. Read along with me silently as I read aloud. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others... Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, is that you? Let them hear. You may be seated in the presence of God. You can smell autumn, can't you? You know the smell of the fall. The crisp air, that it, it hits your body, but you can almost experience that and smell that and taste autumn. I love when people begin to fire up their chimneys. You can smell those beautiful chimneys burning, can't you? I know it's probably illegal, but I love the smell of burning leaves. Oh, do I love the smell of burning leaves. I remember when I was a little kid, we grew up in this little suburb outside of Louisville, Kentucky called Fern Creek. And I remember when fall would begin to hit because the farmers at the end of our road were working day and night to harvest their crop. We were at that intersection of suburbia and farmland in Kentucky where you'd have a new starter home and on the other side of the fence, you know what kind of farm they had there in Kentucky? A tobacco farm. A tobacco farm. Now, let me tell you, don't smoke, don't chew, don't date girls that do. But I love the smell of tobacco hanging in the farm barn at the end of our house in Kentucky. I was seven years old, and the smell of the harvest still takes me back to my childhood. There is something about agricultural imagery that captures our imagination whether it be the decorations that we put up in our home or whether it be the stories that Jesus told. Jesus used stories and images and parables of the harvest to, exc to explain what the kingdom of God was like. He talked last week about the Lord of the harvest. We all know the story of the mustard seed, of how the smallest little seed can bring an amazing harvest. And today we look at the parable of the sower and the ways that we can learn divine realities through common comparisons. Divine realities are revealed in common comparisons. This story here in Matthew 13 begins in an odd way that, to be honest, is really easy to miss or to skip over. It says that Jesus leaves his house and people start getting to him right away. Do you ever walk in the door or out the door and people want your attention and begin to demand things of you right away? Anybody experience that every morning at home, every day at work? You come home from work, Jesus leaves the house, and he can't take but a few steps, but people are coming wanting his attention. And so many people gathered around, 
to hear what he had to say and to seek the truth that he offered, he had to do something that was kind of counterintuitive. He goes down to the beach. He gets in a boat. He sits there while the waves crash on the shore, and he sits in the boat, and he has everybody that came to hear him not sit down on the beach. What does the text say they do? They stand up. Jesus sits to teach, and people stand up to hear from him. You know, I think we're going to start implementing that at Lindenwood. <laughs> that if you came to hear truth, you better stand and get me a stool for my geriatric body. I actually think that the, body, the, 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 the posture and the body language of that text says that those that came to Jesus were anticipating truth. They were anticipating truth. And so Jesus serves up the people that came to hear what he has to say. He tells a story, a common comparison, something everyone could understand. The same way I might say, yesterday I was sitting at the intersection of East Parkway and Poplar and nobody was moving. You kind of get what I'm saying, right? That's what Jesus is doing. He is using everyday imagery to experience and reveal divine realities. There was a sower that goes out to farm. Everybody knew what that was like. They got a cousin that's a farmer. They got an uncle that's a farmer. That was their teenage job when they were a kid outside of Jerusalem. A sower goes out to sow seeds. And the, sow, the seeds are symbols of an invitation to experience growth and grace in God. Jesus says a guy goes out and he begins to sow seeds everywhere as a symbol of inviting people into the divine reality of the kingdom now. The invitation goes out when the seeds begin to be thrown. Now some seeds land on the path. And this path is well trod. This path is busy. This is not a picturesque pastoral path where everyone walks slowly and you can't see anyone. This is like being on Union Avenue at 5 o'clock on a Friday. Everyone is moving fast. And the seeds fall on that path. And it says that the birds come and eat it up right away. Does anyone know what it's like to have other people vying for what it is you have to offer? The birds come and they take this truth, they take this seed, and they eat it up. And there is no longer something for that person to experience nowhere for that seed to grow. The seed not only falls on the path where external forces come and remove it, it falls into rocky places where there's no root for them to go deep. It falls in, like, you know, no one puts roses in a rock garden, but the seed falls among the rocks, and all the good intentions in the world cannot help a seed grow in the rocks. All the good intentions without follow-through and healthy soil will not bring growth. How do I know that this verse of the Bible is absolutely, literally true? Go to the gym in March and ask, who's been a member here for more than a year? People go in March to the gym that have been going to the gym for a while. People that go to the gym in January, what did they do? They signed up in January. They started with good intentions. My friend that runs a gym tells me they make 80% of their money off of people that sign up and never come. They love it when people show up in January and say, I'd like to buy a year membership in cash right now because that is money in the bank. What that really is is money on a rocky field where seeds can't grow because all the good intentions in the world without the follow through of the soil will not bring growth. Jesus also says that not only does this sower throw rocks or throw seeds on the path that get eaten, he throws seeds on the on the rocks that don't have roots. He throws seeds among the thorns. And the language that Matthew uses about how the seed begins to grow, which is a good thing, it begins to be strangled by the thorns. It begins to suffocate the life out of that growth. Does anybody have someone in their life that when you are with them, they stunt your spiritual growth? Does anyone have someone in their, fur their purview, in their circle of influence, when you are with them, you feel drained when you leave? 
let's just be honest here. There are thorns among us, are there not? And you are going to have to sit with some of them in a few Thursdays on Thanksgiving. And they are going to bleed you dry. I thought you all might laugh at that, but it was a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Who you surround yourself with determines whether or not you will grow. Who you lean upon determines whether or not you will grow. And so sometimes seeds fall on the path and the birds eat them. Sometimes the seed falls on the rock and nothing will help it grow. Sometimes the seed falls among the thorns and it's strangled. There's no growth. It's a bad environment. But Jesus ends almost casually. But some of it fell on good soil. And it produced an amazing crop. Growing up in Iowa, we used to call that a bumper crop. I want to tell you some uncomfortable truth. You are 100% responsible for sowing seeds. You are 0% responsible for the state of the soil of the soul of the people you sow that seed with. When I took Pastoral Care 101 in seminary, my professor said that 80% of the people that come to you seeking help are trying to do one thing. Get other people to do things they don't want to do. We do not have control over other people's lives. We do not have control over other people's souls. Some people have the soul of the path where external forces come and eat them alive. Some people have a soul of the rocky soil where there is no roots that are able to grow deep. And some people are surrounding themselves with thorns repeatedly and wondering why they can't breathe deeply at night and why their life has no margin. You are not responsible for the sake of the soil of another person, but you are 100% responsible for sharing grace with them regardless of what the state of their soul is. Because I want you to know, when that seed hits the good soil of a soul, the growth that comes from that is amazing. When I was in seminary, I took a class my freshman year. We called it football player math. You had to pass one math class to get a degree in religion, which is what I was. I only had to take one math, one math class. And they said, you take this class, Jeff. It's you and a bunch of football players. So I'll go in there, and this is Texas. There's like 19 guys named Bubba and one guy named Jeff. I did not do well in that class. I did not do well in that class. In fact, the worst grade I got in college was in intermediate, I mean, introductory college math. I don't even know if they still teach that class or offer credit for it. But even though I did not do well in that class, one thing I know is that one out of four is 25%, right? All you math majors know this. One out of four is 25%. And when I read this story, I think, God, you are terribly inefficient. Only one out of four seeds that are sown, that, it, and that grow, bring blessing. Only one out of four seeds that are thrown out there to people in need take root. Only one out of four seeds find a way to bring growth to someone's life. One out of four is terribly inefficient. And then I read over to Luke where it says that Jesus teaches us, if you've got a hundred sheep and one of them leaves, what should you do after the one that leaves? Go chase it down. I, don't, I think that's 1%, right? That's 1%. That is terribly inefficient. What I know after reading this text is that efficiency is ungodly. Efficiency is ungodly. Now, we would never tolerate it, tolerate it in other elements of our life. If Mike Norvell went out there with a kicker that made one out of four field goals against SMU, would anybody say, that's biblical. That's amazing. No, you get benched, we'd have a walk-on program and get somebody else out that can out there and kick. If Penny Hardaway signed four blue bloods from the city of Memphis and only one of them could see the court, we would say that there's something wrong with the NCAA. Can I get an amen to that, all you Memphis Tiger fans? But that would be terribly inefficient if only one of four recruits could see the floor. If you had an investment program where you put $100 into each into four front funds and 
three of those four funds went to zero right away. Would that be somebody you want to trust your money with? If your air conditioner only worked two days a week in August in Memphis, would you say that that is godly? No, that would say I am on the highway to, well, you finish the sentence. <laughs> Efficiency is not of God, and we see why when we look at the core of how this text closes. One in four seeds will take root. Three of four seeds will do nothing. But when that one seed takes root, it is miraculous. It is miraculous. Jesus says the growth that comes from this is a hundredfold or sixtyfold or thirtyfold. In ancient agriculture, a killer crop was tenfold. Was tenfold. That's the top of the line. The average return on a crop was seven and a half fold. And so Jesus just casually says, you know, three of your four sowing seeds of grace and mercy and love, they might not go anywhere. But for that one that connects, it may be 30 fold, it may be 60 fold, it may be 100 fold. But what is not up for debate is that when God's love takes root in your life, it is a miracle that is the equivalent of Jesus being raised from the dead. Because you have been brought to a life that you would not have any other way. You see, everything good we have in our life is because God gave it to us. Everything good that we have in our life is because of the growth that God has done for us. I want to say this as bluntly as I can. There is no such thing as a self-made man. You did not do that by yourself. And Almighty God gave you the opportunity to do what you do. And we are only where we are because of the rich mercy of God that we have experienced 30, 60, or 100 fold. So what I beg you to do, what I plead with you for today, is sow seeds regardless of the results. Because when that one result hits, the abundance is 30, or 60, or 100 fold. And they begin to share in the experience of knowing all they have and all they are comes from God. Let me tell you some truth this morning, Lyndon Wood. We love to give ourselves credit for everything that goes right. And let's be honest, we blame God when things don't go right. Isn't that correct? Well, let me rephrase that. It's what I say. But anything we have in our lives of worth, of purpose, or of substance is because someone planted a seed in our lives and it grew 30 or 60 or 100 fold. And dare I say, as the people of God, we ought not hoard that abundance. We should share that seed. We should sow that seed. We should be in constant contact with a lost and waiting world that hasn't been able to taste this abundance, who are surrounded by birds that come in and demand things of them, who are surrounded by rocky paths all around them where there is no intentionality or deep roots, or where they have surrounded themselves with thorns that will suck all of the life out of them. I want people to know life in Jesus. And when you sow seeds, and when you take that approach of gratitude that says everything I have comes from the Lord, watch what God can do. Watch what God can do. After World War II, soldiers began to come home from France. I was reminded of this story on as we stand on the dawn of Veterans Day. After World War II, French soldiers began to make their way back home after fighting there on the front. And there was this small group of soldiers, about 40 of them, who had been in so much battle and seen so much evil that they were experiencing a form of amnesia that doctors couldn't even begin to explain and couldn't even begin to describe. And so as they collected these soldiers and began to care for them mentally and spiritually, finally someone got the idea we will put their picture in every newspaper in France so that their family would know who they are. Imagine a 27-year-old man that went to fight the Nazis, and when he comes back, he can't even remember his name. He can't even remember his mother. 
And so they announced in all of the newspapers that one of the largest theaters in downtown Paris would be filled one night. And that if you have a loved one that you have not been able to claim from the war, come down to this theater that evening and we will bring these soldiers out one by one to see if anyone knows who they are. That evening, the theater was packed. Loved ones were curious if their son was dead or alive. Or if their son was alive and he could not remember who they were. And so as the dark theater began to fill, one small light came beaming from the balcony where a young French soldier stepped out there slowly, trembling in front of the crowd. He stepped up to the microphone and he took a deep breath. And he looked into that dark, faceless audience and said, Can anyone tell me who I am? Yes, the sound came from the balcony. Yes, I know who you are. And his mother came racing down the stairs and up onto the stage and embraced him in front of that crowd and prayed his name over him and prayed him back to hell. My friends, this is a scared and tiresome world where we are living on the beaten path where things come to attack us, where we have no deep roots of intentionality, and where the thorns are all around us, and I want you to know what that does to us. We forget who we are. We forget who we are. And so all I can imagine is on a day like this, that you wandered into this dark place that can maybe only be matched by the darkness of what you're going through in life, and you stand up in front of this church and before God and ask, can anyone tell me who I am? I want you to know there is a voice from heaven that is stronger and truer than a word I have to say that says to you, I know who you are. I know who you are. You are a child of God. You are forgiven. You are loved. And you belong. That is God's word for us. And we sow seeds regardless of the results. Because every day, a world is falling asleep and waking up asking this question. Why am I going through this? Can anyone tell me who I am or what this is about? We step into people's lives and share grace so that we can sing that song back to one another. I know who you are. You know who I am. Let us be that for one another. Let us be that for our church. Let us be that for a waiting world. Let's pray together. Almighty God, remind us